Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's professional lunch at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I'm Anthony Rowley. I'm the first vice president of the club, and it's my pleasure today to act as moderator and to introduce our guest, who, of course, is on my right, Dr. Paul Sheard. He is vice chairman of the financial analytics group S&P Global in New York. Um, Paul, as many as you, of you will know, has been a frequent visitor um, to this club, a speaker, I believe, on seven occasions um, over many years, and we're, we're happy and I think fortunate to, to welcome him back again today. Um, he's chosen his, his title, the title of his talk today, and I quote, Making Sense of Trumponomics and the Implications for Japan. I, personally, I think that may be mission impossible because <laughs> um, many of Mr. Trump's critics, I think, um, would claim that they see little sense or reason in anything he the president says or does, whether it's in the sphere of economics or um, foreign policy or, or other areas. So, I, but I think if anyone can make sense of Trumponomics, it's Dr. Sheard, uh, and especially I think his uh, interpretation of what it means for Japan is going to be uh, interesting to the audience today. Um, as I said, he's a regular speaker at this club. He joined S&P Global in 2012 and previously served as Chief Global Economist and Head of Global Economics and Research um, at Standard Poor's Ratings Services, which is now known as S&P Global Ratings. And he was Executive Vice President and Chief Economist of S&P Global. Prior to that, he held uh, chief economist positions at Nomura Securities and at Lehman Brothers, and earlier he was head of Japan Equity Investments and Japan Strategist at Bearing Asset Management here in Tokyo. He appears very often at major conferences around the world, and his views are frequently uh, quoted in international media. He was a member of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on the International Monetary System in 2010 to 2012, and he's a member of the Bretton Woods Committee. Uh, the list goes on, but I just add that Dr. Sheard was formerly on the faculty of the Australian National University, ANU, and at Osaka University, and was a visiting researcher at Stanford University and at the Bank of Japan. He received his bachelor's degree from Monash University in Australia, and a master's degree in economics and a PhD from the ANU. Um, well, with that, I'm going to um, end the introduction and hand over to um, Dr. Sheard. But first, if I can you know, issue the usual health warning. If you have a mobile phone, uh, please switch it off or put it on manner mode as a courtesy to our guest and to your neighbours. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sheard. Well, thank you. For, uh Thank you very much, Anthony, for that uh, very generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, it's always a great honor and a pleasure to be uh, speaking at this uh, uh, professional luncheon of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. Uh, so it's great to be back. Uh, thank you for taking up the time to uh, be with us today. So. Um, Anthony just said, uh, mission, mission impossible. Um, I was going to say, perhaps you, uh, many of you think uh, the attempt to make sense of Trumponomics uh, is a fool's errand. Um, but um, that's really part of the point here, that um, as an economist, let me just say a few framing remarks here. Um, as, an, as an economist sitting in New York, uh, and by citizen being an Australian, uh, not actually participating in the uh, democratic process in the United States, uh, but being there now for tw um, 12 years and trying to understand you know, what's going on in the US economy, what's going on in the, in the US polity uh, as, a, as a, obviously a, a key uh, part of the global economy. What I've been trying to do with the arrival of the Trump um, presidency is really try to sort of understand what is driving it, um, you know, to what extent can you make sense of uh, the policies of the Trump administration, um, you know, separate sort of some of the noise from the signal. And it's quite a challenge uh, sitting there in New York. First of all, um, I am a self-confessed coastal elite. Uh, and a lot of what has been going on in the US, you know, has certainly been framed as 
those in the coast, the coastal elites who've done very well from globalization and technological innovation and uh, financialization of the economy, and those left behind in the so-called flyover zone. It's almost a, a blue coastal elite zone and a red uh, sort of center and south of the country. Um, so sitting in New York, being a coastal elite and being in a very democratic uh, uh, town, uh, it's quite difficult, quite a struggle to sort of separate yourself from uh, the sort of the, the, the emotion, uh, the group think, um, the conventional wisdoms about what's going on and, and try to be sort of objective. Um, I think President Trump doesn't really help in that endeavor because he has a very unconventional uh, style and some would say that he plays very loose and fast uh, with the, the truth and the facts. Um, but I try to sort of filter that out and see what sense we can make of it. So that's the idea of today's talk. And then say a little bit about you know what it means for Japan and, and maybe a little bit about how Japan's going as well. Um, now I've got a handout there I thought because I'm going to throw some facts and figures around um, I just prepared a two-page handout so maybe you can have that. You don't need to follow that as we go through but it'll save you having to write copious notes and numbers etc. Uh, and then there's some other handouts I think just some some articles that might be of, of interest uh, from, you know, and related topics. So what, what, let me just start off by um, sort of doing the following, which is uh, ask the question, you know, what does the data say about the Trump administration uh, to date? Now, again, if you listen to President Trump, you know, he's not shy uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, claiming credit uh, for the economy and, and, and what's been going on. And, but I don't think we should hold that against him per se. Again, I think that there's sometimes a knee-jerk reaction of saying, well, what the president said about the jobs report was clearly wrong, therefore, you know, everything's wrong and we can sort of turn off and, uh, and do something else. So let's, what I try to do here is say, what do the numbers say here? What are the facts? Um, and, and we don't want to have any fake economy here. Uh, so what I've done is just look at the, uh, the sort of year and a half now, almost year and a half of data, and as far as GDP goes, we have five quarters of GDP. And that's probably enough to at least get some sense of a trend. One quarter or two quarters would not be enough, um, but five quarters gives us a bit of a, a benchmark. And so what's the GDP, what does the GDP numbers look like? That's the most fundamental data about the economy. And then compare that with the, the preceding five quarters under the Obama administration. Um, now if you do that and you just look at the basic metric uh, and usually when you look at US GDP you look at quarter on quarter GDP, real GDP growth, seasonally adjusted and at an annualized rate. So we have six numbers and you can take an average of those six numbers and uh, real GDP growth in the US uh, since the first quarter of 2017 is at 2.5 percent. The long-term average, by the way, since the financial crisis and the recovery started in mid-2009 is around about 2.2 or so. So there's been a little bit of a step up in growth. Under the five uh, quarters preceding uh, the arrival of, of President Trump under President Obama, uh, average real GDP growth is one averaging out at 1.6%. So it is true that there has been a, you know, a, bit, a, a pretty decent step up uh, in growth uh, in, in, under the Trump administration. So around about 0 0.9, close to one uh, percentage point. What is interesting though is uh, what you can do, uh, if you are so inclined, is to uh, dig into the GDP numbers and, and, com and, and look at what are the contributions where did that, that pick up in growth come from? And you can break GDP down to consumption, housing investment, a government expenditure, business investment, inventory accumulation or inventory changes, and net exports. And when I did that, looked at that, I was a little bit surprised um, because there's really just one uh, item which is drive, has driven the GDP numbers up, and that is a private uh, business investment, cap, CapEx, capital expenditure. Every, every other... Um, item is more or less, I mean there's a little bit of like rounding error, decimal point differences, but that is why that average growth rate has picked up. Um, and that's about a 0 0.9, oh, the contribution under uh, President Trump is 0 0.8 percentage points, and under President Obama was actually 0 minus 0 0.1. So that's 0 0.9 percentage point different, difference, that's exactly 
what accounts for the increase in GDP growth. GDP numbers, I mean, statistics rarely line up in such a convenient fashion. Um, and, and, and that's sort of convenient in the sense that, it, that the numbers do seem there to be consistent with the sort of um, intuitive explanation that the arrival of President Trump and the administration, for various reasons, has unleashed uh, um, some you know, animal spirits in the economy and that uh, corporate uh, America is, is responding. Now look, it may actually just be coincidence. Um, let's maybe we'll sit here in a year's time and the GDP, GDP numbers have swung around and they're telling a different story, but that's what they say today. Um, now the other number that everybody follows, probably the most closely followed uh, number in the markets, is the monthly payrolls. Net net, how much did, how many jobs were created, so to speak, uh, in that month? Uh, and if we look at the average there, and I've got, uh, as I put this together, 16 months uh, of data, and averaging, averaging that out, uh, actually the number for, for Donald Trump, uh, for the President Trump, is less than under Obama. So it's 187,000 per month on average versus 205,000. Now, now, if you're following the, uh, the debate uh, and, and, and the discussions in the US, that might surprise you because very frequently President Trump will get on TV or tweet or whatever and claim that the labor market is doing so much better, there's so many more jobs now than there were before um, under, under President Obama. Uh, and, and well actually the data doesn't actually say that as far as payrolls go. Now, one little footnote there is that as, as an economy gets closer and closer to what economists call full employment, um, you would expect monthly payrolls growth to come down because, in other words, um, as there's fewer and fewer workers sitting on the sideline, monthly, if you back at full employment, the growth in payrolls will simply be essentially the growth of the, uh, the labor force. And at the moment in the US, that number would probably be around about 100,000, maybe 110,000, something like that. So payrolls growth is still sort of well above that level. But the fact that payrolls has been declining under a President Trump is sort of what you might expect under these circumstances. But again, the President seems to claim that the opposite is happening. So um, uh, that's, that's what the numbers say. Now, what, what about some other labor market numbers? A very important uh, number that economists look at is the labor force participation rate. And you know, one of the things that, that if you sort of read into what the economic thinking might be behind the president's uh, policies, and by the way, that's important because President Trump is, is, is somebody who doesn't talk in economic terms, doesn't talk in policy terms, um, you know, doesn't really seem to have that much time for people like me, economists. I don't blame him for that. You know, economists need to eat their humble pie every now and again. Um, but the point is, he's a very unusual president. He's not a president that has been steeped in public policy and has surrounded himself with you know, economic advisors. Therefore, as an economist, again, I should have said this at the beginning, what I try to do is take what I hear and sort of try and map that into some kind of economic language and then sort of focus on that. And I think if you listen to the president, what he seems to have been saying is the participation rate, you know, has, which has fallen steadily in the US, labor force participation, participation rate is the fraction of people of working age that are actually in the workforce, either employed or, look, or unemployed but looking for jobs. And that number's been coming down, 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 down for a long time in the US and took a further leg down three percentage points uh, after the financial crisis and the Great Recession. So a lot of people looking at the US have been saying, really, uh, for the US, for dynamism to come back into the US, or one p potential source, could be uh, a turnaround in the, in the labor force participation rate. And frankly, given the collective policies of the president, you might have expected that that would, that would be happening. And there's actually quite a bit of scope for that to happen. But when you look at the numbers, the participation rate is 62.8%, the latest number, which is exactly what it was when President Obama stepped down. So nothing much has happened there. But the unemployment rate has continued to come down. And this is one number that you'll hear the president uh, refer to very frequently. And he'll break it out into uh, ethnic groups as well. So he'll talk about the Hispanic unemployment rate is at a record low, or the African-American unemployment rate. Now, part of the reason that the unemployment rate, by the way, is so low in the US, it's now 3.9%. 
that's higher than Japan, but that's a very low number for, for, for the US, uh, is that you know, it had been coming down since you know, 2010 under the previous administration. The unemployment rate in Japan peaked out at, sorry, in the US, peaked out at 10% at the depths of the recession. And when uh, Prof uh, President Obama stepped down, it was 4.7%, so it went down from 10% to 4.7%. Guess what? President Trump doesn't give President Obama much credit for that. If you listen to President Trump, you wouldn't know that happened. It did happen. So, but under President Trump, that decline in the unemployment rate has continued. Um, and at some point, it'll stop because unemployment rate can never go to zero, let alone below zero. Um, but it's, it continues to come down. There has been a significant improvement. Um, so that's sort of the state of the economy and the labor market. Just a couple of other things to note. Uh, what about the trade deficit? One of the things, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, that uh, President Trump uh, has, you know, has in his sights is to reduce the trade deficit uh, of the US. <coughs> but if you look at the goods and services trade deficit, it's actually gone up so far. Now, economists are very skeptical about the ability of uh, the Trump administration to do very much about the trade deficit. And in the short run, if the economy picks up, at most economists, would, if you asked an economist, I think the growth in the US is going to pick up tangibly. Tell me what you think will happen to the trade deficit. They'll say, everybody will tell you, it'll go up. The deficit will get worse. Because the US is not driven by exports. It's driven more by consumption and domestic investment. Uh, and if the economy picks up, guess what? Imports will be sucked in, and the trade deficit will deteriorate. And that's actually happened. Um, but it does give a little bit of grist for the mill, obviously, when it comes to uh, sort of the trade uh, discussions and negotiations. What's the stock market done? Uh, well, this number's a, a few days out of date, but when I checked just uh, at the end of last week, as I was preparing for this trip, uh, the S&P 500 give a plug to our index there, but it's the standard benchmark. S&P 500 is up uh, about 27%, was up about 27%. In the same equivalent period, uh, under the uh, Obama administration, it was up just 1%. So contrary to what many people expected, um, the, uh, the stock market has really rallied, had, a, had a, a, quite a good rally on the back of the Trump administration. And that is despite the fact that under the Trump administration, the Federal Reserve has continued to raise uh, interest rates. The federal funds rate, there have been four hikes. There had been two under President Obama, the end of two, December 2015, December 2016, but there have been three, sorry, four more uh, under the Trump administration. Now, of course, the president has nothing to do with the Fed's interest rate decisions, but it's just worth noting. And Treasury yields, 10-year Treasury yields, uh, went above 3% recently. They've come down again with a little bit of turmoil in the markets, um, but they, they broached uh, 3%. So that's sort of the picture. That's what the numbers tell us about the US economy. And it seems to be a story of some animal spirits being released, um, of growth picking up a little bit in, on the back of investment, and continued improvement in the labor market. And no uh, obvious signs yet of a pickup in wage pressure and inflation. So it's actually a pretty good looking uh, uh, economy, um, but probably not as good as, and certainly in relative terms, uh, as the president would claim. But you know, he's a politician, not an economist. Um, let me now pivot to the next kind of uh, topic of, OK, how do we make sense of what we call Trumponomics, uh, for want of a better word? Um, so let me let me have a go at that. And, and and again, by doing this, I'm not saying that you know I agree with everything here, that everything is a good idea, but I'll just try and distill it a little bit. And also, I'd let make a distinction between what the uh, president appears to be on about with his rhetoric and statements and whatnot, and actually what is happening on the, what policies are actually being implemented. And there's a distance between the two. There's a gap between the two. You might say, well, one of the reasons there's a, there's a gap between the two is that the president just can't go out willy-nilly and implement policies. There is a thing called the Congress. There is a thing called the third branch of government, which is the judiciary. And so actually policy making and, and a president getting his or her agenda through in the United States is, you know, is not that easy a thing. Um, but let, let's have a go at this then. Um, a couple of the slogans that we heard in the election and we continue to hear them is this um, America first or make America great again. What's driving that? Um, 
And by the way, I'm a little bit surprised at how surprised people are about the America First um, uh, mantra. Because if you asked any political scientist uh, worth their salt, they would say the whole working assumption of international relations is every country puts its own national interests first. So perhaps we shouldn't be that surprised that the US, under President Trump, has decided to put its interests first. Again, political scientists would probably say they've always done that. But, but what's really going on here? The way I like to think about this is that I think the big picture here is what's behind the rise of, of Donald Trump, and there's a few things behind it, but one of the things is what we're witnessing is, and I'm not the first person to say this by any means, is a turning point, a historic turning point in what you might call Pax Americana. The Pax Americana was this idea that in the post-war period, there has been a, a single dominant superpower, a benevolent hegemon. And again, some people might say, well, I'm not sure how benevolent it's been, but um, let's call it a benevolent hegemon. Essentially being, has underwritten the stability of the global economic and geopolitical system. Policemen to the world, uh, keeping the peace, maybe sometimes not so peacefully, but uh, underwriting uh, global security, you know, through obviously alliance with Japan, alliance with Australia, where I originally came from, the NATO alliance, um, etc., and keeping the, the, the sea lanes open and trades flowing, etc. Um, that costs money. That takes resources. Um, uh, but that's what the US has been doing, and it's obviously decided that was in its uh, self-interest. The other aspect of, of sort of Pax Americana is the idea that, that uh, throughout the post-war period, and you know, continuing until pretty much now, the US has been sort of, in some sense, quite generous in opening up its market. It's the biggest consumer market in the world, and it opened up its market to Europe, Japan after the, po after the Second World War, to emerging markets, to China, when China entered the WTO in uh, December 2002, I think it was. And it's been sort of the consumer of last resort, maybe the, f the consumer of first resort in many cases. So why is this changing? Well, in a nutshell, it is because I don't think that the US is either willing or able to p play that role uh, in, 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 the, in the world today because things have changed. And one of the things that's changed is that the US is no longer as dominant a part of the global economy as it was. And we've had, rather, the rise of China. Uh, and if you look at the numbers here, and can like to sort of shock my audience, particularly in the US, if you say the way that economists measure or compare GDP across countries so if you say, how big is the Japanese economy relative to the US economy? Economists, economists the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, uh, any of the investment banks, will typically look at uh, a comparison of country, countries in what are called PPP terms, purchasing power parity terms, which basically says if you took a dollar from the US and you bought, you could buy a certain amount with a dollar, if you took that dollar to China, how much would you be able to buy in China? And if you look in PPP terms, China actually surpassed the US as the biggest economy in the world in 2014. Um, so China on that metric is about 18% uh, of, of global GDP, and the US is about 15%. Now, m that's one metric. Um, people still will tend to look in nominal terms, looking just saying, okay, we know, the, nom we know the, the nominal GDP, what's the exchange rate, and you can just calculate shares that way. If you do it that way, the US is still the biggest economy at 24% of GDP against China's 15%, so China still lags. Um, by the way, Japan, you might wonder about Japan, I put the numbers down there, in purchasing power parity terms, China, uh, Japan now is 4.3% uh, of global GDP, and actually it's number four. India is ahead of Japan in PPP terms. China, the US, big gap, India, and then Japan. Um, that's because dollars or yen go much further in India than they do in Japan or the US. Um, in nominal terms, about 6.1%. In nominal exchange rate basis, Japan is still the third largest economy in the world. Um, but China's growing much faster than the US. And if you look at the trailing five-year average, China's been growing about 7.3% on average. Now it's growing more like 6.5%. Uh, the US has been growing about 2.3%. So China's growth rate, about three times the US growth rate. And you know we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But given China's stage of economic development, 
Uh, for example, if you looked at purchasing power parity per capita GDP, the US is about $57,000 and China is about $17,000. Now, you know, can that $17,000 get up to $57,000? Maybe not. Um, but you know, if it gets halfway there, there's still a lot of convergence. In other words, China can continue to grow much faster than the US for a considerable period of time. What that means is, within the world, so we go five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out, US, uh, China is going to become more and more dominant and important relative to the US. So one way of kind of interpreting what Donald Trump has been saying is, is to say, um, you know, what mugs are we? I mean, we, we can't afford to be um, kind of underwriting all of this uh, global security, running a, a, a military about 6% of GDP or 5 or 6% of GDP, um, and being so generous with our uh, access to the market when we don't have as good access to these trading partners that are eating our lunch. That's kind of where he's coming from with that. By the way, um, just I mentioned, I've talked about Geo, uh, the geopolitical uh, security issue uh, a few times. Uh, one of the president's beefs is on NATO, I think, just off the top of my head. Um, I think there are 26 member uh, countries in NATO. And for about 10 years or more now, there's been a kind of a gentleman's or gentlewoman's agreement among the members that they would strive to, spend, to allocate 2% of their GDP to the military. Um, only something like five of the 26 countries actually are achieving 2%. The US, Canada, UK, uh, Poland, and Greece. I think it is sometimes Estonia comes in and out of that group. Um, but you know, you didn't hear Germany, you didn't hear France, you didn't hear Italy, you didn't hear Spain, the biggest, the other big countries. So again, you know, and you will hear the same thing in this country, you'll hear the same thing directed at the South Koreans. It's like, look, we're prepared to be part of an alliance, but you know, we don't have an endless checkbook here. And one of, one of the reasons for that is this make America great again idea, um, which is the infrastructure in the US uh, is pretty uh, creaky um, and leaky in some cases. I get the New York subway uh, every day when I go down to the lower part of Manhattan and somebody who lived in Japan for 17 years and got so used to the Tokyo subway system and uh, whatnot. It is a real shock to the system to live in, in Manhattan and to ride the New York subway. I mean, it's, it's great. It gets you from A to B most of the time. Um, although, a little vignette there, if you look at the weekend, one thing I realized is the New York subway runs 24 hours a day. Tokyo closes down for, what, four or five hours at night. Um, and I'd never in 17 years in Japan experienced like, you know, the subway was closed or, you know, for three hours for repairs or something. Well, on the weekend in New York, they'll post the service changes for the various lines and it will take up about half of that flag. I kid you not. Um, it's, there's so much going on in terms of lines being closed down for the weekend for maintenance and repair. And if you underinvest in an asset, an, a piece of infrastructure, for long enough, which the US has done in many cases, um, it's very, very difficult to catch up. Um, airports, roads, bridges, um, all of that infrastructure is sort of crumbling. Now, economists uh, talk about guns and butter. Uh, you know, Economics 101, you'll learn about guns and butter, which is the idea that if an economy is at full employment and you want to have more of one thing, such as you want to have a stronger military, you're going to have to give up something else, butter, which is your domestic consumption and, and, and whatnot. Um, so, if the US, one of the things that the, the, the president has talked about, of course, is infrastructure, the need to rebuild the infrastructure of the US. Uh, as an economist, I would say, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. You can do that if the rest of the world joins in with burden sharing around military expenditures. That's why the president talks about the NATO 2%, for example. That means you can divert that wonderful infrastructure that's tied up in military hardware on a going forward basis into domestic uh, infrastructure. But unfortunately, you can't do both. And one of the, 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 the points where the president's consistency seems to be breaking down a little bit is that he does seem to want to have his cake and eat it too. In other words, he wants to have uh, his increased military expenditure. Uh, he's now talking much more about you know, maintaining that military superiority and also rebuilding the infrastructure. But actually, 
the infrastructure plans have sort of gone onto the back burner and we haven't really heard very much about them. Um, the, other, the other thing which is sort of behind, um, uh, pardon me, uh, President Trump's victory is um, sort of putting a spotlight on the people that have been left behind by globalization and by technological innovation, which I sort of referred to before. These people sort of in the, in the flyover zone. And economists and, and others for some time now have been pointing out that median wages, sort of average uh, wages, in real terms have been stagnant for, you know, since the early 1970s. And you've probably all seen these graphs pretty much just going sideways. That would basically saying there's really not been any substantive increase in standard of living for sort of middle America. And that's true to a certain extent in many other uh, countries. But the top 1%, rem remember uh, Occupy Wall Street and the top 1%, and many people would say actually the top 0.1% um, are doing extremely well. So a lot of the campaign of, of, of Donald Trump was sort of latching onto this idea, and really he was elected because he carried the industrial heartland, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, those three uh, states in particular. Uh, if he'd lost those three states, Hillary Clinton would be in the White House. And he actually won those three states by the slimmest of margin, literally if about 37,000 people who voted on that day, which is rounding error, had flipped sides, Hillary would be in the White House, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, but those were the heartland states. So again, um, if go back to 2014, Thomas Piketty, a French economist, uh, sort of made headlines with his book Capitalism uh, in the 21st Century, suddenly burst onto the global scene uh, as a French academic, been working on this issue for 20 years, 25 years, but suddenly this book came out um, and really put the spotlight on this inequality issue uh, and the need to do something about that. So, um, you know, how much is being done is another issue though, uh, because when you look at the policies of the president, at least so far, I don't see a lot of kind of follow through on that. There seems to be a reliance on sort of trickle down economics and particularly the tax cut package, cutting corporate taxes, uh, cutting uh, taxes on high income, and also middle and lower income, but high as well. Um, it basically seems to be relying on the old idea of, uh, of trickle down economics. The economic theory there seems to be driven, again, around investment, that if, if corporations and entrepreneurs can be incentivized with lower taxes to invest more, that will create more jobs, that will feed into more economic growth. Um, but it's a very indirect way of really getting at this uh, inequality uh, issue. But I would give some credit, at least, for really sort of putting, in some sense, the political spotlight on this issue. Again, the challenge in the US is, that if you really take inequality issues seriously, and more and more, I think, economists and pu public policy makers are doing that, then the question is, well, what do you do about it? What sort of policies do you do that really uh, deals with this inequality issue, which is very, very structural at this point? And you know, most of the solutions that probably people would come up with, including people in this room, will be something about government programs and government uh, interventions in the economy and you know, within the milieu, the political mi milieu of the United States, it is very difficult to sell the idea that the government is going to solve these problems. Um, it's, it's much easier probably to get that idea across in Europe or in, in Japan. So there's a little bit of an irony there. The president sort of in some ways has put the spotlight on an issue for which in the American context, there's no particularly obvious solution because people wouldn't just not buy the idea of the government having very much of a proactive role in income and wealth redistribution. So how you solve the problem, very, very difficult. Um, another big area that the, that the the president has focused on, of course, how am I going for time? I think I'm... Uh, okay, so I'll, uh, I'll try to speed up a little bit here. Uh, is on is on the whole trade area, and again, I, I, first I tend to start with what is the president saying, and then take it from there. So his real slogan there has been to say yes, I, I love free trade. Free trade is good, but free trade needs to be fair, free but fair trade. What does fair trade mean? It means reciprocal, and reciprocal means symmetric. In other words, very very kind of common sense basis. If the U.S. Is, has a two point two and a half percent tariff on auto imports and China has a 25% tariff on auto imports, you know, the president's fire, as the president's hair goes on fire. 
because he says, hold on a minute, that's not fair. So yeah, I mean, all these economists are telling me that free trade's good, but that doesn't look like free trade to me because it's not fair. Um, now, the way he's going about this then, coming, pulling out of TPP, kind of potentially threatening to pull out of NAFTA, um, putting on various um, uh, trade remedies uh, under various obscure trade acts that the US has, and putting on tariffs on aluminium, steel, maybe on autos, etc. All of that to economists and many people in the public policy sphere looks like, oh, completely the wrong way to go. I would cut him a little bit of slack on this issue because, again, I think in the context of Pax Americana, that idea we talked about before, you know, he's, he's just trying to kind of pivot to say, look, the days when the US opened its market to others didn't demand reciprocal access, they're over. So there's two ways to go here. Either everybody can say, okay, we'll become symmetric. Well, I mean, essentially the, the president is saying, if you don't cut your tariffs, we'll raise ours. That's a bad outcome. The other outcome is to say, okay, let's make sure that we, we do bring all the trade barriers down in a very symmetric fashion. Now, that, of course, is much easier said than done. And you need some really heavyweight political muscle behind any attempt to do so. But the trade experts will all tell you that the Doha round is dead, um, that, that these things are going nowhere. And so maybe there's a way of turning this idea that free trade is good, but free trade needs to be fair, reciprocal, symmetric, into a force to push forward trade liberalization. It doesn't have to mean that we're going into a period of, 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 of protectionism. Um, anyway, so that's, I'll leave that one there. But I think the other thing is, you know, uh, what's behind all of these trade uh, initiatives is President Trump is behaving in some ways like a good game theorist. Now, of course, he's very famous for and proud of the, the art of the deal. And he is the first person to profess that he's the most wonderful negotiator in the world. But the whole crux of, of, of game theory is that if you're bargaining with somebody uh, and you want to shift that person in a direction in a, that will be a better outcome for yourself, you have to threaten them with something. And you have to convince them that you are that, that's something that's going to make them worse off. And you've got to convince them that I'm going to do this and you're going to be worse off or you can, you can agree with me and you can um, give con some concessions and you're actually going to be better off and I'm going to be better off, that's, that's great. That only works if you can make the threat what's called a credible threat. And a credible threat means it is in your best interests if the, if the other person doesn't shift to implement that threat. Um, now most people would say it's crazy to put on big tariffs, but if, if Donald Trump can convince people that he doesn't agree with that, he actually thinks the US can win a trade war, as a negotiating tactic it may actually, I'm not, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but as a negotiating tactic it may actually have some, some sense. So again, trying to make a little bit of sense of this. Maybe he's acting uh, in accords with standard uh, game theoretic ideas. Um, just last point on uh, sort of what he's been doing. Uh, one thing that has surprised me a little bit, and I'll pivot here to um, monetary policy and the Federal Reserve. When, when the President came in, he had a pretty historic opportunity to essentially remake the leadership of the Federal Reserve. The President appoints the uh, Board of Governors, the chairman, uh, Chair of the Fed, uh, and it's obviously it goes for Senate confirmation. Uh, and he's made a number of appointments, a new chair, deputy chair, uh, some <coughs> governor positions, etc. And so far, uh, the president has taken a very conventional, hands-off approach to the Federal Reserve. Now, this is something that you probably won't hear that many people sort of praising the president about, but I think it is worth noting that um, you know, it could have been a lot worse. A lot of people were expecting uh, he would stack the Fed with people that were not credible as central bankers. There were some, some scary names bandied about for a while. Um, but by and large, he's, he's put people on the Federal Reserve that are very well regarded, highly, highly regarded people. And the other thing that people feared was that he would start tweeting at 3 o'clock in the morning, second guessing and criticizing Federal Reserve policy. Um, he's done you know, very, very little of that and hardly made any comments. Um, so I think that's an important point uh, to worth uh, noting here. And, you know, frankly speaking, he could have been a little bit more proactive and a little bit more aggressive in the process of appointing people to the Fed because there is a debate in the US um, about what is the appropriate monetary policy. 
which relates to the question of how much slack is there in the labour market? Um, is it possible uh, you know, to actually push, run the economy hot, that is keep monetary policy very loose, we've also got some fiscal stimulus with the tax cuts, and if we get the infrastructure investment, more with the infrastructure coming. Um, if the economy is at full employment, which is what the Fed judges it to be, that is a recipe for overheating the economy. On the other hand, if it turns out that the, uh, for various reasons, including maybe the fact that the robots are coming, uh, and now everybody is competing with a machine, not just with another worker, and for various reasons, the, the historic relationship between how tight the labour market seems to be and what happens to inflation has broken down. Economists call this the flattening of the Phillips curve. If that's the world we're in, then the appropriate monetary policy would be to just keep running the economy hot and see if you get more that much stronger jobs growth coming through and you don't get the inflation at least for a lot longer. Um, frankly speaking, as an economist, I, I would make that argument. That's what policy should be doing in the US. I haven't heard the president really you know, push that idea it would actually be quite consistent with many of the things that he said. So again, a very conventional hands-off approach to the Fed, um, Federal Reserve officials and many market participants uh, 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 having a, a big sigh of relief there, but I think there's actually a little bit more room for the President to um, be a little bit more innovative in some ways. Okay, I think we're running out of time, so maybe I'll leave most of the implications of Japan um, you know, for the Q&A. I had a, I, I've got a few bullet points there which are more just taking stock of the Japanese economy, uh, taking stock, stock of, of Abenomics. Um, obviously, that's the topic of another day, but um, many of the goals of Abenomics, particularly the Bank of Japan achieving a 2% inflation target, is still very much work in progress. Um, but I think there have been some, I'm a very big supporter, as many of you will know, of the approach taken uh, by the Kuroda Bank of Japan. I think it's the right approach. I would argue that at this point, with some progress having been made in lifting in, uh, wage growth and inflation in the US, and with the labor market being as tight as it is, um, the, the Bank of Japan would be advised to just continue to use brute force, in a way. That, what I mean by that, just keep monetary policy on the current path, very stimulatory, keep growth running above potential growth. That means keep tightening the labor market, la the unemployment rates down to 2.5, job offers to applicants is at the highest level since January 1974. Many people in this room were probably not born in 1974. The Japanese labor market has never been tighter in your life. Yes, the responsiveness of inflation may be very slow and lagging, but unless the rules of economics have been completely turned on their head, it will come. And so that would be my suggestion there. Keep with, with this uh, persistence and brute force to raise inflation expectations. The, new, the usual logic of monetary policy is the central bank can raise inflation expectations, inflation will follow. I think because Japan's been in deflation for so long, it actually needs to do the other way around. Raise inflation, and then inflation expectations will follow. But anyway, that's pretty good. But at the end of the day, even if you've, you cure deflation, you get nominal growth in this economy, what really matters is the real living standards, that is real potential growth. And you know, to do that, I would just repeat my normal talking point, which is uh, I think Japan looks, look, look, needs to look more seriously at embracing uh, immigration, and help to create a virtuous cycle of increasing labor force participation. More immigrants will help particularly more uh, Japanese women into the labor force. That's a, a, a still untapped resource. And also help to raise the fertility rate uh, and create a virtual cycle there because population growth is a key driver of economic growth. Um, but what does it all mean? What does all the Trump uh, uh, mean Trump, uh, Trumponomics and everything else mean for Japan, I just, you know, just very quickly mention here, I lived in Japan, I was active in the policy debate as an academic, um, I very well remember, and I wrote a lot about it at the time, the Structural Impediments Initiative. You remember the late 80s and the early 1990s, where Japan had a big current account surplus, a big trade surplus, and America was saying, you know, you have to do something about that. And there was a huge debate. And Japan did respond, I think fairly well to that. One of the ways they responded was by investing in the US, um, 
and creating jobs uh, and are there and less exports and more domestic production. So I guess a quick point I'd like to make here is Japan has a lot of experience, sort of been there, done that, um, you know, has I think some track record on its side and has a bit of a template um, for um, dealing with these issues. One little thing that might be a little bit of concern is the Japanese current account surplus, not so much the trade surplus, but at least the current account surplus is creeping up again. It's 4% of GDP. Now, Germany is 8% of GDP. So frankly speaking, if I was a Japanese, I'd say, don't look at us, look at the Germans. Um, but China's current account surplus is now down to 1%. So it's a little bit harder to point the finger at the Chinese in this regard. Now, current account surplus is two components. It's the trade surplus, and it's the income surplus. And one of the reasons Japan has such a healthy current account surplus is it has such an accumulated net foreign asset position. It earns a lot of money on those investments. But, but I guess as someone who's living in the US now, um, a more broader point is not just ac across the issue of Trumponomics, is that I think you know, Japan should be more visible, more engaging, uh, more proactive uh, in the world. And, and certainly, you know, when it comes to Trumponomics, you need to be there. You need to have a seat at the table. You need to be visible. You need to be whispering uh, in the president's ear. And sometimes Japan has sort of, um, yeah, kind of slipped back a little bit on that on that margin. Sorry, I went over a little bit, Anthony. No, uh, perhaps a little bit too ambitious. But uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. No, th thank you very much for a very informative and balanced account. I think even I begin to understand a little bit more the sense of Trumponomics now. Okay, let's open the floor to questions first from the working press, as usual. Um, any questions from working press? Um, if not, uh, I, I would like to... Oh, yes, sorry, are you with press? Uh, yeah. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, I guess I can just... Yeah, no, come, to the, come to the microphone. No, no, come to the microphone here, please. State, state your name and uh, affiliation, please. Uh, Corey Baird from the Japan Times. Uh, thanks for your talk today. Uh, you said uh, an interesting thing towards the end of your pr uh, presentation. Unless a rule of economics uh, hasn't been turned on its head, I think we'll start to possibly see inflation in a tight labor market. Well, I think in the United States case, a lot of economists, very well-known economists, thought that inflation would start to tick up as soon as uh, unemployment in the United States went under 6.5%. We're now at 3.9%. Um, in Japan, I think the, a lot of economists, even Kuroda himself, thought that uh, inflation would start to tick up as soon as uh, unemployment rate hit probably under 3%. He was really shocked recently when it hit 2.4%. So um, what makes you think still that uh, the key is to drive down unemployment in order to raise inflation? And what uh, doesn't make, what uh, makes you not think that it's maybe some other factor like the lack of unionization or uh, maybe automation or something like that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Well, I mean, all of those factors are important, and particularly automation and artificial intelligence. And, you know, there are not that many people probably in the white, is this working? Uh, Okay. Yeah. There are probably not that you know not that many people in the white collar sphere now. If you're an investment banker or an analyst or an accountant or a lawyer or something, um, that is inclined to go into your boss's room and, and ask uh, he or her for a hefty price ra raise, because you may get the answer. Well, actually, speaking of your job, we're going to we just bought an AI program and we don't actually need you anymore. So I think there is this idea that, that one of the, the the flattening of the of the, the Phillips curve. There, there's sort of two reasons. Phillips curve is a relationship between sort of the amount of uh, you know, slack in the labor market and sort of wage and price pressure. And that's become less responsive. One of the reasons is actually uh, that central banks have been, become much more successful with uh, their ability to manage inflation expectations. So that sort of breaks that link when you get either excess or deficient uh, slack in the labor market prices don't respond as much because everybody thinks that inflation is going to stay around 2%. So that's actually a good aspect. But the other aspect is this competing with machines and AI, etc. But why would you expect, um, you know, again, if, you, if, if, the, if the US, if the, sorry, if the Japanese economy uh, continues to uh, yeah, the, grow above potential and you get a tighter and tighter labor market, all other things being equal, then that you know, will, I think, show up in some wage pressure. Because and the, the mechanism is basically that if you've got so much demand that um, you just don't have enough 
workers to, to actually you know, fulfill that demand. And you know, companies start bidding up wages at the you know, establishment level, uh, factory level or whatever, to get the workers. And that's basically the look, you know, just the way labour markets work. Um, so that that's really the process that has to work. And then bottom up, and that's why I use the word sort of brute force, rather than trying to manage it top down by changing expectations, just create a situation where there is a labour shortage. The, the typical response to a labour shortage is wages start getting bid up. If that phenomenon then becomes more generalised, which it should be, if there's labour force shortage across the whole economy, that will then start to feed in, into, pri into prices. And um, by the way, again, I know there's been a lot of disappointment with the lack of progress towards the, or the lack of achievement of the 2% inflation target. But I would not throw the towel in at all here. Again, if you look at the numbers, I think that scheduled wages in Japan are now growing at about half a percent year on year. But if you go back to early 2013, when Governor Kuroda took over, that was more like minus 1%, and similarly with you know, headline inflation. So you could argue about halfway to, the, to, to, to where you need to be um, to now would not be the time to throw in the towel. If I could, sorry, could I quickly ask you a question myself before I come to you? Um, you said that Mr. Trump can't have his cake and eat it, which is obviously true, but where does military spending rate in Mr. Trump's list of priorities, do you think? Some people f feel, for instance, that one reason why he's so anxious to do a deal with North Korea is that he would like to see a reduction in US troops in South Korea and possibly even in Japan to cut the military spending. Is that a major priority for him, do you think? Mm. Um, great question, Anthony. I mean, I, again, I'm, you know, I speak with a little bit of um, kind of you know humility here because I wouldn't say I'm a, either a political expert, let alone a sort of a military expert, and that's a whole you know whole class of expertise in its own um, right. But just you know, listening to again the rhetoric and some of the policy action of the president. Um, you know, he it seems to be very enamored of this idea of the U.S. still being the mightiest fighting force in the world, and you know he talks a lot about the you know the the decrepit state actually, and people people talk about the creaking infrastructure in the in the. The U.S. Um, you know, a thing that you hear a lot about in the U.S. as well is the readiness of the U.S. military. That a lot of the ships and a lot of the planes and other, um, uh, you know, kind of military hardware um, is not fit for, uh, you know, for deployment. There's been underinvestment in the military. Now, if you know, if you're in the military-industrial complex and you've been spending in the past six or seven percent of GDP, you know, a lot of butter has been coming your way, which you've turned into guns, you know, any diminution of that, you know, you're going to be, say, oh, my, my conscience, this is not good. So I think, and, you know, there is, the US is a very patriotic uh, place, you know, the, the idea, you know, you don't usually lose many votes by rallying around the flag. Um, and so there may be just, you know, the, it could be either that President Trump doesn't see the inconsistency. That's possible. Uh, he doesn't realize that there is a trade-off here. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You have to choose between guns and butter. Uh, that's a real dangerous mixing of metaphors, if ever there was one. Uh, but, or it could be that he's being a little bit more strategic and, and more maybe tactical and saying, I'll you know, pick my battles. Uh, and maybe the US military does need a little bit of fortification before we enter a period of a more structural, secular uh, decline, conditional on solving the North Korean problem, getting the, uh, the NATO allies to, to fess up a little bit more. So maybe there's a, there's a grander design here. But as we sit here and speak today, I, I would say I've been a little bit disappointed that President Trump hasn't followed through on this make America great again, America first rhetoric to say, look, all of this means I am going to hold my allies accountable. Um, but we're going to start to pull back a little bit here and redeploy national resources into bolstering, not just building a wall, that's infrastructure as well, but bolstering the national infrastructure. That's what America first and make America great again means. Um, it doesn't mean we're withdrawing from the world, but we're going to make, we're going to enforce burden sharing. Um, and I think that's a difficult, you know, if that pop proposition is put to the Japanese, to the South Koreans, to the Germans, etc. I mean, you don't really have too many legs to stand on if you say, no, we want to continue to operate under your military alliance and your nuclear umbrella protection, um, but, you know, don't expect us to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, write, sign any more checks. Okay. Right. If there are no questions from Working Press, oh, there is Martin.
Martin Kölling, Handelsblatt Germany. Um, I was wondering, I mean, now we are basically facing the trade negotiations, tariffs on cars are now the hot topic in Japan and in Germany especially. Uh, so what do you think uh, is the reason first for uh, putting the tariffs on the table right now and uh, how should Japan and maybe Germany react? Mm. Thank you, Martin. Um, well, I, I think the you know the the reason is I guess you know that that the, the auto sector I mean it's a, still a big sector of the U.S. economy. Um, it uh, it plays into if we put it in political terms. A it's sort of consistent with the rhetoric that the president had in the campaign, and he has sort of followed through on most of his promises one way or another, and it does play to his base. Um, and, you know, he may genuinely, be, uh, again, when you listen to, to Trump on trade, he will say things like, you know, we've cut these terrible deals in the past. Um, we haven't maximized the U.S. leverage. We've been sort of too generous. Maybe we've been worrying about the global good, not enough about the national good. And, you know, autos being such a big and important sector, and of course, you mentioned Germany and Japan, both of those countries being, you know, major auto producers and exporters, not you know, exporters to the U.S., although I don't think the numbers are, um, are massively uh, large in the grand scheme of things. Um, it's sort of an easy, an easy one to take target at. And, you know, the auto industry is, you know, within the, the economy has this multiplier effect as well to, um, you know, steel and plastics and rubber and all sorts of other electronics these days as well. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's an attractive sector um, to, to sort of target in that regard. What, um, and, and just on the trade issues, there's, Two, um, there's a number of things here, obviously. There's TPP, there's the NAFTA, um, there's the Section 301 action against China, and then there's this, this Section 232. Um, so Section 301 is on intellectual property. That's under a 1974 Trade Act. There's another act of 1960, which is the Section 232, and that's the National Security one. So it's, it's just, I've just mentioned this to separate out. Um, when you hear these things thrown around, there's two very different kind of issues here. There's a sort of China issue on intellectual property, uh, and that, uh, and so a lot of things that, that the president is doing with China are following on from that action, which was launched in August of last year, and a major report uh, quite a doorstopper was produced by the USTR, which came out of maybe two or three months ago. Uh, which basically finds China kind of guilty of stealing intellectual property, and the president is sort of using that as a lever uh, over China, and maybe through the back door on some of the North Korean stuff. The, two th the Section 232 stuff is, is basically saying we need to protect uh, aluminium, steel, and maybe autos. They're going to do a, a, an investigation of that. That hasn't been decided because these industries have some kind of strategic significance, uh, you know, for, for security. Um, so, what do you, you know, what do you do about that? Again, reluctant to give advice to <laughs> to governments about these things, but um, I think what you do is a combination of what. You, first of all, you know, listen. I think that the president. It doesn't take well to people, you know, taking him on. So again, if you're on the other side of the negotiating, negotiating table, uh, fighting back, uh, you know, as hard as he's coming at you, probably is not the best thing to do. Although emotionally, you might want to do that. You're probably going to come out on the worst end of that deal. So you you, you sort of find ways to listen and to sort of see if you can sort of uh, kind of you know accommodate to a certain extent. You try to marshal as many sort of facts as possible. Um, you know, facts like what you know, whatever the facts are. But you know, for Japan, some of the facts would be: Look, we confronted this issue 25 years ago. We heard you. We took certain actions. You know, Honda, Toyota, Nissan, building plants in the U.S. Um, you know, if you're not happy with the progress, let's think about maybe, you know, we'll talk to our companies and we'll see if, you know, they're prepared to maybe make some more investments. And you're sort of aiming to get the president's attention focus away from you <laughs> and convince him that you've heard him. You, you kind of, you're not arguing the toss too much here and you're going to make best efforts uh, to, to do something about it. Um, and, you know, apropos of the geopolitical things, I mean, you know, again, I 
dangerously straying into out of my comfort zone here, but um, Germany is the biggest economy in the EU and uh, one of the biggest in NATO, and you know is consistently undershooting the two percent target. So that the more that you can do credibly to assuage concerns there, maybe buys you some slack on the trade front as well. I think we've got time for just about one more question. Um, um, the question I would like to ask very quickly. Oh, there's one over there. Oh, one over there. Sorry. Oh, yes, I couldn't see your hand. Sorry. Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Jordan Fisher. I run a uh, small tech startup uh, around freelancers and small businesses. Uh, in Japan right now, there's a big movement called Hatakata Kaikaku, which is to really improve the way people work and kind of empower freelancers. Um, in the States, there's obviously a huge freelance momentum. Uh, I think you know millennials are looking to be 50% of you know involvement in some way. What advice or what would you say for Japan in trying to kind of increase that freelance engagement? Um, and also, um, how do you look at it from a macroeconomical perspective in terms of freelance contributions to GDP? Because it never really shows up in any of the, the big high-level numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of... Um, I mean, it's almost kind of a, a, a cliche of economists to say, well, you know, structural reform of the labor market, the more flexible that you can make the labor market, um, the more easier you make it for companies to, you know, hire as well as fire potentially, because if you make it hard to fire, you make it hard to hire. And the more that you can create a, uh, a more active secondary labor market, the, the better. Um, I mean, I'm not close enough now to all the, the, the details on the labor law and, and everything that the other administration has done around labor market deregulation. But you know, uh, you know, big picture sort of, you know, a little bit sort of cliche-ish, the traditional Japanese labor market, particularly in the, um, uh, in the, in the large firm sector which dominates the economy, you, you've sort of had a situation where you've had these internalized labor markets. And it's a sort of a chicken and egg issue. If you have a lot of internalized labor markets, then by definition you don't have a very active secondary labor market. But um, it's very difficult to create one because, um, you know, who wants to be the first person to, to sort of go out of that internal labor market hierarchy and, and, and you don't, you know, if you leave, no one's going to hire you because they've got their own internal labor market. So, but I think over the last, you know, several decades in Japan, the labor market has been coming, uh, you know, endogenously more mobile and more liquid and more, more um, uh, flexible. And the, it's, it's a virtuous cycle kind of thing. The more that happens, the easier it is to, to progress further in that, in that direction. So this sort of freelance um, sort of gig economy, you know, um, is, uh, you know, I think is part of that ecosystem. It's not perhaps the main part, but around the edges, it's a ra rather important uh, part of the ecosystem. So, the, and I, I think that's that's kind of happening. That's the direction of travel. It's certainly the direction of travel globally. Um, people now, you know, having, and, and of course, the tables have been turned to a large extent. And, and uh, you know, in the U.S. these days, it seems like you know, if you're a smart graduate from an Ivy League school, the last place you want to go is to a big company. That's not cool. You want to go to a startup. Um, so I don't know the extent to which that sort of atmospheric is coming to Japan, but you know it's a global trend, and presumably it, it probably will come to Japan. So maybe you know freelancing will become the new cool thing to do. But you know the problem is there has to be enough freelancers, there has to be enough ability to freelance, that is to move in and out of gigs, um, you know for that model to be sustained. In terms of the macroeconomy, I mean, I think it just it, it adds to the sort of flexibility of, 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 the, of the economy, um, and you know, is uh, you know, in theory, is you know, good for you know, for, for potential growth. Do I cut it off there? I think there was one hand raised. Can we take just one last one here? Yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, 
uh, Nicholas Smith, CLSA. Uh, could you help out with expectations on BOJ policy? I mean, obviously, it isn't working. Um, CPI has been um, has been dropping, despite cost push from um, from overseas. The more that I visit um, investors overseas, the further you get from Japan, the more they believe that um, the BOJ is going to uh, to normalise, reverse what they're doing. Why do they think that? Is it because um, because uh, the policy is inappropriate for Japan, so a, a country with um, banks at um, loan to deposit at 70 percent, it's got enough money already, there's no point printing more. Uh, or do they know something that no one in Japan does? <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um uh, yeah, well, that's a, that's a big that's a big uh, big question and, and plays to one of my areas of expertise. So I have to rein myself in a little bit here. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so what, well, again, I, I'm I'm sort of part of my answer will sort of with these issues will be sort of more positive and part will be normative uh, in the sense that like you, someone in the markets, um, you know, I've I've been. A, 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 had my views on these things. I've, uh, you know, I've sort of pushed for different policy positions over time. So, uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, I'm a big supporter of what you know Governor Kuroda has done at the Bank of Japan. Um, but uh, let me just go back to a piece I wrote in, in 2013 when the policy shift happened with QQE. Um, I, I said, you know, as far as the Bank of Japan is concerned, this is the right thing to do. But I also warned that this would not be it would not be easy by any means to achieve 2% inflation. And um, it's, you, you could say one of the mistakes that the Bank of Japan made and Governor Kuroda made, although I sort of understand why he did this, was to create the impression that he thought it could be done in two years. It was almost setting himself up for failure. Um, it was always going to take, I think, a, a lot longer. And there were three, I, 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 I said there were three reasons why you'd expect it to to actually be an up uphill battle. Not impossible, but, but you know, it's going to take a while. Uh, start with the simplest one, QE, even if you do it on a, on a massive scale, and you slightly alluded to this, Nick, in your question, um, you know, in theory and in practice is a very weak stimulatory tool for the economy. And for various reasons, in Japan's case, it's actually even weaker. So that, not to say don't do it, but you, know, you see the charts where it looks like they're printing this enormous amount of money. For every dollar or every yen that a central bank prints under QE, what it's doing essentially is taking a dollar or a yen of typically a government debt security out of the portfolio of the private sector. So all it's actually doing is just changing the composition a little bit uh, of, of the private sector's portfolio. And the closer the asset that it buys, is to the asset it supplies, the less impact you'd expect to have. And when interest rates are already at 80 basis points, 10-year yields as they were with JGBs, to replace those 80 basis point yielding JGBs with you know, 0% yielding current account deposits from the Bank of Japan, it gives you a little bit of monetary easing, but not very much. So first reason was QE is not going to be a silver bullet here. Not a reason for not doing it, but a reason to be cautious about expecting how much you could do. For 25 years, I've argued that the way to end deflation in Japan, it's a macro problem, is to mobilize monetary and fiscal policy in a sustained, aggressive, and coordinated fashion. And I would, pos I would proffer that that has actually never been tried in Japan. And even under Abenomics, where the Bank of Japan I don't think can be particularly faulted, guess what? One year into that experiment, the government put the uh, fiscal brakes on with the consumption tax hike. So. Um, that was not sustained, coordinated, aggressive monetary and fiscal policy. And now we have, of course, the consumption tax hike October 2019 looming, uh, and that is sort of, you know, won't be as bad, wouldn't be as bad, but potentially the same thing. The third reason that I was skeptical about it sort of working was um, what I called the credibility deficit that the bank, that Kuroda San started with, which is the idea that if, if the key variable in convincing, almost by definition, the Japanese public that the Bank of Japan is committed to doing whatever it takes to achieve 2% inflation, if the key variable is you know, the credibility of the central bank, that is the fact that the public will now believe the central bank, and therefore the more they believe the central bank, the more that their own expectations will change in a direction that makes it a, a, a sort of actually a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, the key problem was just because Governor Kuroda arrived and started espousing one theory, 
doesn't mean that everybody would say, oh, that theory that Governor uh, Shirakawa convinced us of over the last five years, Governor Kuroda says it's wrong, therefore I'm going to believe that that's wrong and I'm now going to believe Governor Kuroda. Um, it just was never going to work like that. So credibility being the most important variable, the credibility deficit has been very, very difficult to, um, to, to uh, overcome. And I think your question is very instructive in that regard, Nick, because you talked about skepticism, particularly the further you go away from Japan, about whether the Bank of Japan will continue. Um, you know, that's a very undermining force in the system. By almost by definition, and particularly to the extent that it exists in Japan. So I think that um, fiscal policy has to help and certainly should not um, undermine the Bank of Japan's efforts. Um, but as I mentioned before, there has been about a 50% sort of improvement directionally or quantitatively in the right direction. And I think it's just a matter of sort of continuing to, 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 to go on. Just maybe last point, um, end on a slightly um, controversial note. One thing that I've noted is that you know, regardless of where you stand on this position of will QE eventually work, won't it work, you know, yield curve control now as well, um, is it's, it's an interesting kind of mousetrap that's been set up. And I think actually all of the central banks doing QE, because the Fed, Bank of England, ECB as well, have kind of, nobody's really overtly talking about this too much, but basically this mousetrap is such that um, QE means the central bank refinances government debt securities into central bank money. And it hopes to achieve its inflation target by doing so. There's a key difference between government debt securities and central bank money, and that is that government debt securities have to be repaid or refinanced, and that refinancing need is what gives rise to the scope to have a fiscal crisis kind of event, which everybody worries about. Central bank reserves never have to be repaid. There is no refinancing date. And therefore, that kind, the more that government debt securities get refinanced into central bank reserves, logically, the less chance there must be of that kind of fiscal uh, crisis uh, event, just by the nature of the, the beast. Now, of course, any card-carrying economist at this point would put their hand up and say, yeah, but hold on a minute. That's we don't want central banks to monetize fiscal deficits and government debt because that leads to inflation. But that's exactly the thing that you're trying to create in Japan. So a little bit of, of that, um, uh, that medicine may not be uh, uh, going too far astray. Okay, I'm sorry, I will have to cut you off there. It's normal for the moderator to say that we would like you to come back again, but we really would like you to come back again. I mean, you've covered an awful lot of ground. There's an awful lot more ground to cover. Let me renew your oh. honorary membership of the club, and thank you very much for coming today. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much.